Um, welcome everybody. It's 12.45 on my computer, so I suppose that we start with this session. It's a session on resources and knowledge centers for language and AI research. It is moderated by Jorgita Vajcenonien and myself. The session contains six papers. Can you go to the next slide, Jorgita? Yes. They are listed here. They will uh, briefly introduce themselves, uh, but especially they will address some of the questions that Jorgita and I formulated and that I will read out here. They are on the next slide. So the first question relates to resources and service uptake. Is clear and reliable information available about the actual usage of resources and case center services? Which resource and service potentials have so far been underused? And how can the uptake of resources be stimulated and facilitated? And the second question basically addresses uh, the different side of the same coin, user awareness. Are the targeted users sufficiently aware of existing language resources or case center services? And if not, how might it be increased? And should not only the data centers, but also the creators of the resources play a role here? And can you sketch some instruments to increase the awareness? The third question that we formulated has to do with cooperation perspectives um, for Claren case centers. What we see is that many of Claren's case centers have expertise in the creation, collection, and processing of textual corpora for a particular language. But such, should such case centers not collaborate to exchange information and coordinate to bring a uniform message for aspects that are not language specific? And in what ways might such a collaboration and coordination between case centers be developed? And the final question has to do with resources and Claren B centers. New resources are integrated into the Claren infrastructure by depositing them at the certified Claren B center. The papers that describe the creation of new resources in this session do not seem to have concrete arrangements with a Claren Center yet. So the question that we ask is, can you describe the current state and shouldn't a Claren B Center have been contacted from the very start of the resource creation or collection project? We are on a very strict time schedule, so I urge the presenters to stick to the time frame allotted to them when they briefly summarize their work and address these questions. If there are any questions from the audience, please type them in the chat. And if there is time, we may be able to deal with some of them. There is ample opportunity to learn more about the work reported on in this session, in this afternoon's poster session, as well as to enter into a direct discussion with the authors. So we will now go over to the presentation. So, and I give the floor to your Gita. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, well, I would like to welcome our first speaker, uh, Jakob Lenardic, to present uh, the extensive work done on the Claren resource and tool families. And although you call it an initiative, uh, I feel it, it is a knowledge center, a cross border knowledge center on its own. So, Jakob, you are welcome. Uh, thank you, Jurgita. Uh, so uh, uh, first, I'd like to briefly summarize the main point of this paper and then move on to some of the questions. Could you perhaps uh, move to the next slide, please? Uh, thank you. Now, in the context of the Clarion tool, Tools and Resource Families Initiative, we have prepared quite extensive uh, uh, reports on metadata issues related to the resources and tools in the Clarion repositories and in the VLO. Uh, in the case of corpora, for instance, this is missing information on size, missing information on license, and missing information on annotation. Uh, we were able to identify around 450 such metadata issues, and since 2018, we've been able to solve around 20% of them with the help of the User Involvement Committee as well as the National Clarion Representatives. Uh, now, here I'd like to turn to the first question uh, posed by you, which is regarding resource and service uptake. And I'd concretely like to address the sub-question, which resource and service potentials have so far been underused? Now, in the context of this initiative, the answer uh, is language tools. Uh, what we've primarily found out is that language tools developed by Clarion Consortia generally aren't as fre frequently listed uh, in the B certified repositories as language resources. We've also argued that it's likely that because the tools aren't in the repositories, they're also generally more badly documented than the resources. 
Uh, furthermore, and related to this, I would say that the VLO as a means for a researcher to find relevant tools is underused since the main CMDI profiles are currently tailored to resource metadata, uh, as is quite well known, and uh, also reported in a paper by Jan Odek. Now, I think that one first step solution here would be to offer search facets in the VLO that would be tailored to tools specifically, so that you could, for instance, search for tools on the basis of their functionality, like uh, part of speech tagging or named entity recognition, which currently isn't possible. Uh, on a more positive note, uh, this initiative has proven itself to be successful in relation to raising user awareness. Uh, to give a very simple example, all the resource uh, and tool families have extremely high search ranking scores in Google. If you, for instance, type parliamentary corpora in Google without specifying Clarin, you'll get the resource family subpage for parliamentary corpora as the highest search result. Uh, however, it's also true that most of the feedback that I've personally received regarding this initiative, uh, apart from the, 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 the core Clarion team, is, is by resource developers that aren't affiliated with Clarion, but would like to see their resources or tools featured in this initiative. However, I have little insight how research actually use the initiative or how ex external humanities researchers use this initiative uh, or actually find out about Clarion in this way. Now, we will attempt to raise further awareness by creating and promoting concrete use cases uh, where we will invite research researchers who have used some of the client tools and resources in their work. Uh, we'll ask them to prepare practical examples showcasing how they have solved the research problem in a step-by-step -step fashion by using the tool or resource. And this, I think, will also be appreciated in the context of promoting Clarion universities, since such examples of use that are simple to, uh, to understand are bo both relevant in the classroom context and, uh, as uh, some of the consortia have reported, are sorely missing. And uh, this is the re cap and a sort of answer to, to and my answer to, to the first two questions. So thank you. And thank you very much. Um, and then maybe we'll have the questions afterwards. So I invite uh, our next presenters, Rachel Pankhurst and Francesca Frantini, to overview the uptake of the FIA corpus of authentic French text messages. Uh, you are very much welcome. Thank you, Hogita. Okay, so Francesca and I uh, would like to present here a computer mediated discourse, digital discourse corpus called 88 mil SMS. Our focus is on pertinent scientific and pedagogical reuse in relation to fair principles, which are an important paradigm, of course, in data stewardship. In the domain of language resources and digital humanities, uh, many initiatives already stated principles and best practices which predated fair and at the same time seem to be going in the same direction, for instance, are uh, the FlareNet recommendations. Infrastructures such as Clarin and Humanum have built upon such ideas, making it easier for researchers to adhere to the requirements of the FAIR principles. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. The 88 mil corpus, SMS corpus was collected by my colleagues and myself within the framework of the International SMS for Science project, which aimed at building a worldwide database and analyzing authentic text messages in different languages. Um, from the onset of the Sud for Science project, the scientific team stressed the utmost importance related to the possibility of easy access and reuse of authentic data. So in 2011, over 88,000 authentic French text messages were collected during a 13-week period from the general public in Montpellier, France, and SMS donors were also invited to fill out a sociolinguistic questionnaire. And an anonymization phase was conducted owing to legal requirements for data protection of private data, and this involved anonymizing first and last names, nicknames, etc. Next slide, please. So at the end of the slide, I'll start answering the questions. The 88 mil, mil SMS has been available on the Humanum web service since 2014 and on the Autolong repository for four years now. So any text searches such as SMS or CMC corpus on VLO, Isidore, Alra, and simply Google ensure that the corpus is truly findable. Our corpus is fully accessible because we adopted a clear set of licenses and promoted open access, all the while staying within copyright uh, limits and data protection regulations. The initial 88 mil SMS format became fully interoperable once the corpus appeared on Autolong and that we followed the common Comere TEI format. We also used UTF-8, which was crucial for preserving emoji appearing uh, within text messages. So in terms of reuse, the corpus has been downloaded from 51 countries worldwide over 1000 times on the human and website alone. So to answer question one, um, usage of resources is checked through downloads and also with our scientific newsletter for updates. 
for questions two and three, the inclusion of the corpus on the, in the Comeri uh, CMC collection, which in turn was linked to CMC related initiatives, including Clara workshops. Uh, this helped in disseminating the resource as well as in harmonizing practices. And Comeri is also listed in the Clara and resource families, which adds to the visibility. Question four is not so relevant for our corpus, which was collected in 2011, but Autolong is due to be B certified soon. And also Comoré was an initiative within Corley, but they're going to be talking about that in a later speech. Next slide, please. So results of our survey on scientific usage of the corpus have shown a strong uh, disciplinary tendency towards language sciences and computing, including NLP, text mining, and corpus linguistics research, mainly from higher education establishments. We use the corpus ourselves with undergrad and postgraduate students, and we're happy to announce its recent inclusion on the Sketch Engine platform. So to conclude, as we have shown, several important activities that ensured the adherence of the corpus to standards and best data practices, including the FAIR principles, were carried out after the official end of the project. In this sense, the collaboration with infrastructures was essential. And I'll let you read uh, what we'd like to do accomplish for future research so as to not go over my four minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, and, and thank you, Rachel. And, and it's really fantastic to see the uptick of the corpus. It's really very impressive. And uh, you can think of much more things that can be done with it. Let's say diachronic comparison of the data and so on. So thank you very much. Uh, you. And now I would like to... Um, invite uh, Dennis Eckert to introduce the initiative of compiling, compiling the parallel corpus of Esperanto, uh, the language of hope, uh, which I think may be especially interesting for even several uh, millions of its users. So the floor is yours. Dear colleagues, Bonan Tagen and uh, Francesca Frontini and myself intend to present a parallel corpus of the late 19th century the first dictionaries of Esperanto. Next slide, please. Uh, the early adoptance of this auxiliary international language after the four first brochures were published in 1887 in Warsaw, created a number of small dictionaries in order to disseminate Esperanto in various linguistic and cultural communities. Next slide, please. I could identify 17 of such dictionaries in 15 target languages prepared between 1887 and 1890. They are remarkably similar with the same list of around 900 entries. Next slide, please. I already digitized 12 of these dictionaries in OCR format in 10 different languages, such as Yiddish, Russian, French, Italian, etc. Next slide, please. Our idea is to make this corpus available to a large multidisciplinary audience through Clarion and to allow also the general public to gain access to it. For that purpose, the documents uh, need to be presented in an appropriate standardized format. Several questions arise and we would expect to get support from the Clarion community to solve them. Since I'm not myself familiar with the Clarion infrastructure, specific questions should be better discussed with Francesca this afternoon. First question. Some of these dictionaries are written in languages that we do not master at all, and sometimes printed in old spellings or typefaces, such as Latvian, Danish, Hebrew, Romanian. We wish to create a small network of scholars combining different linguistic skills in order to complete the OCR encoding. Second question. We also intend to fully encode in TEI format these 17 documents. Francesca Frontini has already done a preliminary encoding of two of these dictionaries. Expert assistant inside Clarion would be highly appreciated for that. Third question, the Clarion infrastructure and community would be a perfect instrument 
for spreading the corpus in various disciplinary communities, making it available to a wide range of scholars. We will be very happy to share ideas this afternoon. Danko multe pro via antento. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope there will be a lot of discussions. It's really a very interesting project. Um, and uh, I invite our uh, next speaker, Dimitrios Kokinakis, to share experience on uh, uh, working with neuropsychological domain data. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Uh, so um, the paper in the conference describes a snapshot of ongoing work to collect a large data set from a rather large cohort with participants born 1944 in Sweden. And uh, these are uh, Swedish uh, native speakers. And our aim is to uh, study early signs of cognitive decline. So we collect and analyze language data in order to get uh, insights in how to identify, quantify, and characterize cognitive deficits. So uh, we also plan to combine this data, this language markers with biomarkers. And our hypothesis uh, for, for that is that the combination of language-based results with results from from other parallel studies that using the same uh, cohort uh, with the biomarkers uh, could improve the accuracy of the diagnosis for uh, neural degeneration. So our vision is to under better understand and manage neural degenerative impairment early and investigate correlations between the features and the modalities in, in order to improve both classification and prediction and make uh, uh, diagnosis more accurate. Uh, now, with respect to the questions, uh, that uh, were posted. So uh, available information is not very clear yet, and neither on usage or services from Clarin. And that is because of many reasons. For example, uh, we haven't studied the analysis yet of the data to in order to use Clarin resources for that. And also uh, the collection of the data is in ongoing and delayed because of the COVID-19. Uh, it actually uh, restarted a couple of weeks ago. So we don't have a, a, a the, the final de demographics and statistics about the data. So in a sense, everything is underused, but there is information and metadata uh, of the data already collected and, uh, and uh, from the previous cohorts in the study. And these are uh, available at the National Data Service Infrastructure Center, uh, which is a Clarin uh, type A center. Um, now with respect to the second question about user awareness, uh, uh, with respect to the resources we describe, uh, uh, at the moment is only a blog post, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, such events that the, the current one are, I think, a very important channels for increasing the awareness of the uh, uh, of the of the resource. Uh, this can be continued, of course, by participating our participation in other kinds of events uh, in order to raise awareness, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, also we. Uh, will target uh, events where the clinicians and the medical people are, are involved. Um, and now to the respect to the cooperation perspective, I think, uh, again, events such as this one are very important channels for future cooperation. So starting with the dissemination in suitable national events to uh, clearing uh, case centers, members can be one way to achieve this. Uh, and uh, for, for instance, discussing uh, questions like, um, privacy concerns because the data we collect is uh, has some unique characteristics so uh, ethic questions and privacy concerns are very important um with respect to the last question you had about the resources and the clearing B centers uh, yeah definitely i mean uh, the deposition of data is uh, is uh, the most appropriate way to guarantee that uh, uh, future licensing and, and use and also tracking the citations and everything is very important. So, so uh, uh, as I said in the beginning, the, the, the study has already established contacts with the Taipei Center, and I, I hope this will continue in the near future. Um, uh, of course, the deposition of the data poses a lot of challenges for us because, uh, uh, because the data it, uh, collection is taking place in very different locations, and, uh, and it started the uh, long time before uh, uh, and outside the clearing community. So, so uh, I, I hope I'm, I'm strongly um, believe that, that 
at least the language data in this cohort will be available and deposed in the McLaren B Center. So uh, yes, uh, the last thing, the last note, uh, I, I agree that Claring B should have been contacted earlier, but because of different uh, practicalities, different issues uh, didn't allow us this to happen. This is, this is basically because our involvement in this large project started at a stage that did not allow us to be part from the very, uh, very beginning. And then I have a very strong feelings that the clinician's workflow uh, could not be changed at that point when we entered the project. So that's the basic reason. So thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I think that uh, I'm not sure uh, we had more slides, but- Yeah, it was about uh, not, <laughs> it was about not the questions, but uh, actually the maybe then I think yeah. they will be shared then will be available. Or, or, yeah, yeah. available and, and everything is in the proceedings. But yeah. really, thank you very much for referring to the questions. That was very interesting and, and helpful. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, now, actually, uh, we have uh, a certain uh, thematic shift from resources to knowledge sharing services and uh, I would like to invite Eva Sorole uh, to overview the French Knowledge Center activities and, and work. You're welcome. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, so my name is Eva Soroli. I'm Associate Professor of um, Psycholinguistics at the University of Lille in France. And today I'm presenting the French Knowledge Center and the actions of um, our consortium, which was a, at the beginning a Corley consortium, um, a consortium of hundreds of researchers around France from more than 15 universities with expertise in corpus linguistics, uh, French language, but also in other languages spoken in France. Uh, now Corley became in August officially a Clarin Knowledge Center. It is organized in six working groups that address challenges related to um, interoperability, multimodality, multilingualism, legal issues, corpus annotation, and assessments. Uh, the groups follow a committee approach and offer both proactive and reactive knowledge to the users through the um, case center. We have a um, contact form that people can use to answer questions, to, 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 ad to address their questions, and then we can contact them um, and put them together with specialists in their domain. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So um, through our website, we offer different types of knowledge, let's say. So uh, first, declarative knowledge. So information about the most important data repositories, advice about annotation principles, uh, best practice recommendations for data storage, metadata standardization, file conversion, and anonymization. In order to answer to your question about uh, the relationship we have with um, other B and C centers, uh, for this declarative part, we work with other services um, like B and C centers, like the Cocoon and the Ortolong depositories in France. So when users come to us and they um, ask us how to create a new resource. We systematically advise them to make available their corpora, but also all relevant documents, manuals, descriptions, metadata from the very beginning of the project in collaboration with those B and C centers. Uh, you had a question about the cooperation perspective. So of course, our role as a knowledge center is to facilitate the exchange of information and promote uh, interoperability and coordinate the users in this direction. So we strongly advise them to systematically use standardized formats for the annotation of their corpora uh, through good practice uh, guidelines, following the next, the, sorry, following the text encoding initiative, the uh, guidelines that we disseminate through our website. Uh, the Corley Case Center offers also procedural knowledge that, that we can see on the slide now. Uh, so ac we, we offer access to technical manuals, advice about proper citation of existing data sets, recommendations on methodology. One of our main role uh, is to raise users' awareness. So 
the members of the Corley Case Center, all academics, professors, researchers, engineers, with, with strong expertise in data collection, data mining, digital tools, organize every year training sessions for PhD students, but also for researchers working in the domain. So the idea is to encourage them to use the tools of our centers, K, B, and C centers. So raise their awareness and so learn more about existing language resources and methods. The Corley Center uh, aims also to offer schematic information about corpus research, for instance, management checklists, guidelines for research plans, examples of research questions and procedures, advice for the preparation of ethical approval applications, but also strategic information. So this is the last part of the slide. Uh, thank you. So uh, we offer also strategic information about the necessary steps and sequencing of research protocol, recommendations about data collection and flow diagrams on the life cycle of the corpus. So my last slide is just um, a positive note to say that knowledge centers are very important. We believe that sharing knowledge is more efficient when it's linked. And we heard this morning some some talks about linked knowledge and how it's important to have combined declarative, procedural, schematic, and strategic information offered both in a proactive but also in a reactive ways to researchers. Uh, knowledge sharing through Corley helps not only linguists but also anyone working with corpora or interested in language use to stay abreast of changes and make the most of the knowledge we already have in the domain. Minimize duplication of effort, especially in domains that address similar research questions, and that way increase innovation. Corley also supports synergistic activities and the creation of new collaborations, facilitates replicability of results, which is a long-standing tenet of scientific method, and thus supports high-quality research. So uh, finally, the linked resources offered by Corley aim to contribute in building more solid collective knowledge. So thank you so much. We're waiting uh, this afternoon, uh, if you want to learn more, to join us to the, to the Zoom room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very informative. Um, well, and uh, I invite our last speaker of this session, uh, Nikola Ljubesic, uh, to continue the discussion on knowledge centers and specifically on the Klasla Knowledge Center for South Slavic Languages. Hi, Nikola. Hi, Rita. So, hello, everybody. Uh, I will, in very short, obviously, present the Klasla Knowledge Center of South Slavic Languages. So, for the South Slavic Language Group, if anybody is not in, uh, uh, aware of, uh, it covers the following official languages, Slovenian, Croatian, Bosnian, Serbian, Montenegrin, Macedonian, and Bulgarian. Uh, the Knowledge Center has been approved more, slightly more than one year ago, and it is currently being run by the Slovenian Clarin SC and the Bulgarian Klada BG. So while setting up the Knowledge Center, we had two main goals in mind. The first one was the coordination of efforts on developing uh, technologies and resources for this uh, language group as the languages are very similar between each other and having similar technologies and similar protocols while developing resources sounded like a very reasonable idea. The second main goal was joint training activities for our underlying user base. And uh, by now we can already uh, report on, you, on uh, successful uh, results on both topics. So first of all, for the coordination of efforts in developing technologies, we managed to add, for instance, the Bulgarian series of tools into our own Klasla pipeline. So now besides having state-of-the-art results for Slovenian, Croatian, and Serbian. And now this is also the case for Bulgarian. For the second point, the joint training activities, I can report here the, the first class lab workshop that had to be held in Ljubljana in May 
but was obviously had to be actually postponed, but in the end we decided to hold it in an online fashion. So we by now had multiple Zoom sessions. Uh, one was actually being run just before this session. And the amount of uh, information uh, that is being um, that is being uh, um, exchanged in these Zoom sessions is extraordinary. And actually, these user involvement workshops would, in my opinion, be the best way of increasing user awareness. So just for this workshop, uh, we did request some funding from uh, Claren. It was approved, but in the end, we, did, we were not able to use it just because we didn't have any costs. But for the interest in the workshop, we had more than triple the amount of interest than was uh, initially possible to be hosted in Ljubljana. Nevertheless, given that this was in the end an online uh, event, everybody was able to join in. For the second question on how to uh, measure the resource or service uptake, we have a help desk set up. So this is the main uh, communication interface between the knowledge center and the users. And whoever has any issues in using the resources on question on how you to use the resources, this is the uh, channel that is being used. Here we can report that most questions come in form of how to use resources or what resources are available. The second most important or most frequent question is on how methodologically, how to set up methodologically their research. And the third question is on how to use specific tools or technologies. And uh, one additional uh, format that we have for increasing user awareness but also communicating everything that is available from our uh, knowledge center are frequently asked questions so we have frequently asked questions for slovenian croatian serbian uh, up while, and bulgarian up while macedonian is being added as we speak and for the final question of how to uh, on the cooperation perspective between knowledge centers so how I see the knowledge centers right now and uh, their landscape is I see two types of knowledge centers. Uh, the first type is focused on a specific topic, while the second type of knowledge centers is focused on a specific language or language family. So the previously presented and this knowledge center are obviously of the second kind. And us being a, a language family oriented uh, knowledge center, I see two types of possible collaborations. First of all, with, this, with the knowledge centers that is also focused on language or language families on many uh, topics starting from how to uh, develop specific solutions make them as uh, useful as possible for the community how to communicate with the community etc while for the second type of knowledge centers that focus on a specific topic uh, the uh, coordination is quite obvious so while we try to cover specific language or language family as possible these knowledge centers have the utmost knowledge on a specific topic so if we wanted to uh, I, uh, develop uh, solutions on that topic in our languages, the knowledge center would be the most obvious place for our uh, to start uh, the development. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And then I thank you once again all for your presentations and us uh, answer to the questions. Uh, and we still have some time for discussion. I invite the audience to write their questions in the chat box area. And uh, I think maybe I'll hand over to Jan because you have some questions as well. So uh, until we're waiting for the audience questions, maybe then you could uh, give, give some of yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Yogita. Well, I first would like to um, go to Eva uh, because um, the last speaker was uh, quite clear about uh, how uh, he saw potential cooperation with other knowledge centers. I missed it in your presentation. Maybe I uh, overlooked it, but maybe you can respond to this and see how you see a cooperation between knowledge centers, like, for example, the one, the, uh, the class lab one. Yes. Um, yeah, in my talk, I only talked about um, collaborations with between knowledge centers, B and C centers in France. Uh, but of course, we have many researchers who uh, work with us in the knowledge center in a cross-linguistic perspective. So there are, there are lots of uh, people who are interested in other languages. So yes, one, one collaboration would be um, 
among um, knowledge centers that specialize in specific topics, especially in specific languages, like the Slavic uh, ones. Lots of centers and uh, lots of uh, research labs in France work in, in Slavic in comparison with uh, Romance languages like French. So yes, it would be a good point to, to collaborate. So we are quite new in the domain. We just started in, in August as a knowledge center. So uh, it would be a great idea to have uh, this cross knowledge center uh, collaboration. Thank okay, you. thank you. I see no questions from the audience yet. So please do not hesitate to ask questions. Uh, I have another question, which is now uh, addressed to the uh, Klasla uh, Knowledge Center. So Klasla has undertaken many of the tasks that usually are assigned to national consortia within the Claren area, such as language resources, repositories, a web service, etc. So my question is actually, will it not have a bad effect uh, that so you cover multiple languages from multiple countries that are let's say uh, uh, related languages, but will this not have a bad effect that governments of the non-Clarin member countries will be less willing to participate in Clarin because the Klasla uh, Knowledge Center is already doing a lot of the things that they are supposed to do. We are actually hoping for the opposite, for uh, the uh, governments of the languages that, or the countries that are still not part of the Clarin um, uh, infrastructure to realize and recognize the, uh, uh, the potential that Clarin has for these languages and to start considering joining the, um, the Clarin family. While right now this is not the case and I'm not sure to what extent these governments are aware of, uh, are aware of uh, Clarin and what Clarin has to offer uh, to the languages and to the speakers of these languages. And I think I'm afraid we have run out of time. So thank you once again for joining us here.